We are broadcasting live here from Sausalito Books by the Bay on the waterfront at the store here. And we're delighted to have some very interesting guests with us. I think all of us would agree that fire smart gardening and defensible landscaping are very timely issues right now. They're very, very important based on the raging wildfires that we've experienced and what seems to be this inevitable climate change that's making everything so much more arid. So we are going to be hearing from some experts this evening about fire smart gardening and defensible landscaping, specifically in Sausalito. And to get us started, I am delighted to have Faye Mark, who is a UC Marin Master Gardener with us this evening. She is the Marin Master Gardener in charge of Fire Smart Gardening and uh, Educational Outreach for the organization. She uh, is a Sausalito resident. She was one of the founders of Sausalito Beautiful. And in a former life, she was a high profile Silicon Valley technology executive. So, but now she's into gardening and landscaping and we're delighted to have her with us this evening. We are also going to hear from our co-host, Bill Hines with Sausalito Beautiful. He's the president of that prestigious organization here in town. So the format will be, there's Bill. Hello, Bill. Thank you for joining us and thank you for co-hosting with Sausalito Books by the Bay. We're going to start with Faye's presentation followed by Q&A. Um, if you are familiar with the webinar format on Zoom, you are all muted and we can't see you, but you can ask questions at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A bar, there's a chat bar, and I'll be responding to those. And when Faye finishes, we'll do Q&A followed by a little bit of what to think about for fall and winter gardening and some of our favorite books about this subject. And then we'll also hear from Bill about all of the initiatives that Sausalito Beautiful is undertaking right now and what they've accomplished in the past. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us again. And I'm going to turn everything over to Faye Mark now. Thank you, Faye. Take it. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share and uh... Cheryl, you have to let me know, make sure. Oh, I need you to enable my screen sharing. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, and I'm gonna put this in slideshow mode. Do you see the presentation? Yep, yep. Okay. it's all working. Great, here we go. So you, yep, there you go, perfect. It's perfect. All right. So just in case anyone's on, let's make sure that you're here to hear the fire smart landscaping is a healthy landscape presentation and not expecting something else. So um, as master gardeners, we extend science based research and field tested data to provide education on best gardening practices to the public and with fire smart landscaping. Research is evolving and studies are underway to better understand vegetation management for uh, residential landscapes. So we really encourage you to continue to um, listen to presentations and uh, continue to stay abreast of uh, what's, what's currently um, happening both at the state level as well as at the local level. Um, in, today, in our talk, in my talk today, um, I'll share some best practices to achieve a healthy, environmentally sound residential landscape because a healthy landscape um, not only provides benefits to the ecological well being of our environment, but it can help to mitigate the risk of embers igniting vegetation on your landscape. Then I'll describe how to incorporate fire smart landscaping into your existing landscape. And then I'll pose some questions to help you understand and consider what type of environmentally sound and fire smart landscape works for you. And I'll wrap up with some tips on what you can do today to create a fire smart property that is um, no to low cost and suggest some intermediate steps you can take that will require some cost and some longer term planning. So what is a healthy residential landscape? It's the result of providing best horticultural and gardening practices for your yard. 
Having a healthy landscape discourages pests on a long-term basis and will significantly reduce, if not eliminate, the need of any type of pesticide, which often has a negative impact on our environment. There's a lot of material written and available on our website on best practices, but today I'm going to start with best practices on plant health and that, um, and that plant health throughout your, your landscape will be resilient if it's healthy, and it will be more resilient to embers and heat from flames um, should a wildland fire occur. Um, that resiliency is one of several methods that you can employ to create a fire smart landscape. And it also brings safety to the community, it encourages wildlife, and it enhances your property. So we're gonna start with sun and sun exposure. Um, and so I think we all know that not all plants are created equal when it comes to their sunlight requirements. Um, a plant that needs full sun might not produce as many flowers or the color intensity might suffer if it's in a shady spot. So for example, the north facing side of a structure, primarily your home on your property or even fencing can create enough shade that, um, that uh, challenges um, how well a plant will or won't uh, thrive. Um, likewise, a plant that, um, uh, that grows in the sun, so for example, on the south or west side of the property, if it's not well suited to full sun, it can scorch, it could wilt, it could die and become a fire hazard. So before you decide to eliminate or plant uh, to, to eliminate a plant or um, if before you decide to add a plant to your property, you want to first monitor all areas of your yard um, so you can determine um, sunlight exposure throughout the, the yard. Um, this can give you a lot of clues if an existing plant is struggling um, and it, it helps you decide when you, when you go to choose a new plant um, exactly where in your yard it will thrive. Um, there are um, sun seeker applications that run on e-devices um, like iPads. There's one that I use um, throughout the year and um, it, it helps track um, the sun relative to your property. Um, and and it, it's a great way to, um, to really map uh, your property so that you're prepared when you do go to purchase plants. So, Gardens are, are living, they're, they're not static. And over time, trees and shrubs near a plant, you add it, get bigger and cast uh, more shade. Um, others die and let in more light. And so, you know, a plant that was once well matched to the light conditions in your garden may now need to be moved. Um, if you suspect that a plant is, is not thriving um, given the, the lighting conditions, um, there are several things that you can do, and the most obvious one is to relocate the plant. And if you're new to gardening, you may be reluctant to do this, but it's okay. Plants are, are pretty forgiving about being moved. Um, you, you really want to avoid doing it midsummer or when a plant is flowering. Another essential component to a healthy residential landscape is uh, soil. And um, Healthy soil is alive with microorganisms that feed the plants living in it. Um, the type of plants that you want will determine the type of soil that you use. California native plants, well, they're not quite as fussy. Whereas ornamental plants like roses need a balanced pH and often require amendments to balance the pH level. And edible plants do really well in organically amended soil. So depending on what type of plant you're adding to your garden will determine if you need to leave the soil alone or if you need to amend it. Um, ways that you can test your soil is um, using a soil kit that are available at local hardware stores and nurseries. Um, this will help you determine things like the pH value uh, of, your, of your soil. Um, you can also get um, even more detailed results than what you would get through these uh, kits uh, doing a Formal lab test, um, there's more information about that on the UC Marin Master Gardener website. 
So a plant's performance is governed by climate. And that include climate is about the length of the growing season, uh, timing, and the amount of rainfall, winter lows, summer highs, wind, and humidity. Um, here in Marin County, let me pull up my little, oops, uh-oh, what just happened? Let me escape here. Let me go back. And I think I hit, there we go. Sorry about that. Let me get out my little pen. Uh, laser pointer. So, and let me go back a slide here and get back to the climates. Um, we have these various climates throughout Marin County. Um, we're over here. Uh, here's uh, the Golden Gate GGNRA. Here we are in Sausalito, Larkspur, Fairfax, Nicasio area, all the way up to Point Reyes. Um, so depending on where you live will be a factor in determining which plants will thrive and require less maintenance. Um, so in zone 15, that's our coastal range and that's characterized by warmer breezy summer temperatures and colder winters with more frost. The average temperatures can range between 22 degrees and 106 degrees. Sunset zone 16 is the north coast thermal belt and that offers us gentle afternoon summer breezes plus heavier winter rainfalls with some frost. The average temperatures in that zone range from 25 to 105 degrees. And then in zone 17, that's the marine effects zone and that's the region that's often foggy and cooler in the summer with mild, um, cool and windier winters. Um, so that average temperature ranges from about 30 to 97 degrees. Um, so in addition to being aware of the climate where you live, also be aware of the microclimate on your property. Uh, microclimates are climate factors particular to your garden, and they can, they can differ significantly. Um, I mean, in my garden, I have a, several degrees different temperature between the back of my garden, the back of my house, and the front of my house, which is yet different from my neighbor's uh, climate. So um, also just be aware of that, um, again, by uh, uh, monitoring um, sun exposure on your property. Structures walls, fences, and other plants and trees can also affect the amount of sun and shade in a garden. And so, for example, in this garden, look, look right here. What do you see? You see shade that's cast from the house. Um, and then you've got a growing uh, plum tree here and, and another growing what looks to be maybe a, a maple tree. In time, the canopies of these trees will increase and the, the plants under them, depending on, on how the, the sun moves across the property, will cast shadows. And some of these plants will be affected by that. So um, just be aware of that on your own property. So I'm gonna skip water for now. It's a very precious resource and it deserves its own slide. And I wanna get into that in more detail in the upcoming slides. So, so far we learned that these components need to be considered for a healthy landscape. Sun, soil, climate, microclimate, water, which I'll get to next, and then plant care. Um, plant care combines all of the above, and it also includes removing weeds, which can compete with your garden plants for light, moisture, nutrients, so you want to keep them in check. Dead weeds and dead grasses are also fire hazards and should be removed, especially close to the perimeter of any structure on your property, not just your house. So a low maintenance way to control weeds begins with using mulch. And mulching is an important practice in any healthy garden. Mulch is any permeable material used to cover the soil to prevent weed growth, slow water loss, and prevent erosion. Mulch shades the soil and prevents the germination of weed seeds. But wood, oh, look at that. That's a really blurry slide. Um, wood mulch can be ignited by embers. So 
please do not use wood mulch within the first five feet of the perimeter of any structure on your property. You can rake it up, you can move it to another part of your property, but just keep it away from the first five feet. Plant care also includes pruning. Um, this is an important topic in and of itself, and it it's, can be pretty complicated. Um, it's, it, it's so detailed um, that we actually have pr a pruning guild um, as part of the Master Gardener uh, training. Um, and Master Gardeners will spend years learning about this topic. Um, pruning improves the plant's overall health. It can prevent the spread of disease. It can, it can increase the number and quality of fruit or flowers or foliage. Um, it improves air circulation. It allows light to reach the inner and lower leaves and can correct weak or narrow crotches in a tree. Um, one of the important aspects of pruning with a fire smart garden is about spacing and I'll get into that in the fire smart section of the presentation. So there is one trick to gardening that most gardeners know but don't practice and that's proper plant spacing. Um, plants that have to compete with their neighbors for soil nutrients and sunlight are not going to be as healthy as those that have all of the nutrients that they need. Plus their roots will have to compete not only for nutrients and water, but also for space and sunlight. So also realize that um, having too few plants can be a problem. Some plants require a certain number of neighbors to pollinate. Um, so make sure you don't end up with too few plants. And also realize that shade from properly spaced plants can actually help to crowd out weeds uh, by providing shade. Um, when, you, when you purchase a plant, read the plant tag. Um, if the plant doesn't have a tag that goes with it, talk to the nursery um, specialist and uh, pay close attention to the light requirements, the water needs, and um, most importantly, to its size at maturity. You know, we often buy plants that are in, in five gallon pots or, or, you know, four inch, and we really don't stop to think about, well, how large is this plant going to get? And then um, make sure that it's, it's spaced properly. So every garden, no matter how small, can provide a habitat for animals and it's an important part of protecting and encouraging wildlife um, and the greater ecosystem. Um, as you plant and care for your garden, you have a direct impact on the health of the food chain today and for future generations. Beneficial insects such as ladybugs, garden spiders, and bees, to name a few, are responsible for maintaining that delicate balance between good and bad organisms that affect the garden. Other beneficial garden animals include frogs, lizards, snakes, and bats, and they can serve to decrease the harmful insect populations. Um, you can lure beneficial wildlife into your garden using um, shelter, food, and water sources. Uh, bird houses encourage birds to nest. Water allows insects and birds to drink and bathe. Um, California native plants and trees attract insects that um, help native uh, birds feed their young. Uh, Bob Maselli, my fellow master gardener and now mentor on native plants says, I never met a Ceanothus I didn't like. And so what you're looking at is a beautiful uh, Ceanothus in bloom. So what I promised earlier was an overview of properly watering plants. So we know that water is a precious resource here in our drought prone uh, climate. And there really is a right time to water your outdoor plants, whether you're taking care of potted plants or a vegetable garden. Um, do it in the morning, a few hours before or right after sunrise. Watering in the morning allows uh, your plants to absorb more because less water is evaporated in cooler temperatures. Uh, watering at night might seem like a good alternative, but without the sun to warm the plants and the soil, excess and standing water can lead to rot and fungus issues. Um, ideally, your landscape is set up with an irrigation system so that you don't have to be the one to get up uh, at, the, at the crack of dawn, but um, 
it's really important that your irrigation system is designed to work with um, the plants in your landscape. Um, you've, many of you have probably heard the term hydrozone. Uh, you can do this by creating uh, plant zones, hydrozones. So plants of similar cultural and water needs are grouped together um, and that creates efficiencies uh, for watering. You also wanna keep your drip irrigation system in good condition. So at least check it annually, uh, make sure the valves are working correctly and that there are no leaks in the emitters. Um, I check my programs pretty frequently on um, my irrigation controller and I adjust them both as their seasonal changes as well as the plants uh, mature and um, have different watering requirements. And remember, it's really important that you irrigate to maintain the water balance your, your plant needs. Not what you think it needs, but what the plant needs. No more and no less. So don't assume. Feel the soil. Use a trowel. Dig down. Check the soil. Use your finger. If, when in doubt, if, if you're confused about what's going on with your soil, give us a call. We have an award-winning garden walks program that helps homeowners with water usage in their landscape. Um, a couple of UC Marin Master Gardeners will visit your garden. They'll um, suggest irrigation improvements and um, possibly make some recommendations on uh, plant selections. And you can contact them through our website. So now we're gonna get into the fire smart landscaping portion of the presentation. And like healthy landscaping, fire smart landscaping is a strategy. It's a strategy for incorporating the best practices that I just talked about into your garden. The goal of the fire smart landscaping is to avoid home ignition. When the garden is healthy, plants are thriving, there is adequate spacing between plants, trees, structures, and the property is clear of fuel such as leaf litter or other combustible materials. So how do you achieve this? Well, first you start thinking about your property in terms of zones. Currently, the nomenclature for the space zero to five feet from any perimeter of any structure in your property is referred to as zone zero. This is, um, this is shown here in blue. Um, now, I recognize this does not look like a Marin County property. Um, quite frankly, this doesn't look like too many people's property. But it, what it exemplifies is that you can have a, a different structures on your property. So with zone zero, this is the area closest to the structure on the property. And um, it includes the area um, under the footprint, around the footprint of an attached deck or um, stair landing. And uh, we know this is an important defensible space area because uh, post-fire assessments and research have demonstrated that this is the most vulnerable area around your home. Um, zone one, as shown here in red, is what is referred to as the clean, lean, and green zone. And the goal of this area is to reduce the connectivity between garden beds, shrubs, trees, so that if wildfire does come into this zone, the vegetation will not draw that fire towards the property. So for today, I'm going to lecture, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on zone zero and one. If you'd like to learn more about zones two, three, and four, you can do that on our website. You can also uh, go onto the Fire Safe Marin website. There's a lot of information on this uh, part of the defensible space system. And also, before I go any further, let me just offer a note about zones. You know, we talk about feet, but it's the exact number of feet is less important than the idea of what is immediate versus intermediate proximity uh, to your home. So um, in zone zero, since wood mulch is combustible, fire officials are recommending that um, you rake it away Put it someplace else in your garden because your, your plants will thrive having that um, uh, under the plant and protecting the soil. 
Um, but the recommendation is to replace it with uh, permeable, non-combustible materials. Um, if, if, if you need a, a pathway, uh, materials such as um, sand, set in pavers, uh, porous concrete paving, interlocking pavers, gravel, pathways cut with four to six inch gaps, all of these allow water to uh, circulate back into your property, which is very important for uh, soil health. Um, now, these materials do not decompose to feed the soil, and, and they can raise the temperature um, uh, of your landscape. So an alternative to this is compost, and quite frankly, that's what I use on my property. Um, you have to get used to, to looking at soil as opposed to you know, an uninterrupted path of, of greenery and, you know, the beauty of mulch, but um, it's a very reasonable uh, approach. Um, plantings that are low growing and well hydrated and retain water that are non-woody could be used and considered within that five foot uh, space of, uh, around the perimeter of your home. Um, but it also depends on your, the home hardening conditions and it should be discussed with your local fire official. Um, other management of plants and materials in zone zero include regularly watering plants to prevent dry vegetation, removing dead plant material from the plants, uh, removing plants adjacent to combustible siding and foundation vents, as well as plants under or next to windows um, and under eaves, uh, uh, vents, or interior corners. Uh, those are the most vulnerable areas of, of your home. And this is a big no-no. Um, storing anything combustible under your deck is, is considered a, a very significant fire hazard. So what I presented earlier about right plants in the right place also applies to a fire smart landscape. So I'm going to show you a, a few properties where I can point out um, some things that um, uh, may help by example. And, and by no means do we uh, wish to em embarrass or, or, or perhaps show a home that um, is yours or, or, or perhaps a good friend's, but it, it really is uh, for the purpose of sincere uh, illustration. Um, in, in this example, um, you can imagine that if, a, if an ember landed on this beautiful uh, uh, arcing uh, rose bush, that it could potentially lead to the ignition of what looks to be a, a, a relatively old roof. You can imagine that the litter from this uh, is ending up in the gutter, uh, creating a, additional dry material that, that um, an ember could ignite. Uh, you've got most likely a single pane glass window here that could burst should uh, a flame um, reach up into, into the canopy of this plant. You also have wood planters on um, what pro I imagine that the front door is here. If these wood planters ignited, um, uh, ingress or egress out, in or out of this house uh, for, for fire officials to um, either uh, try to help somebody escape or for a person to escape on their own could be impeded if this were to catch fire. You also have vines coming up the side of the house here. Um, we know that in the fall, often these vines um, uh, uh, dry out and can become yet another fire hazard. You can imagine if this caught on fire, flames reach up at least two times the height of the plant and you could see how that could get up into the rafters. Um, next I'm going to show uh, an example of um, some gardens that have some very nice fire uh, smart features. Um, this property um, has a very nice native uh, pollinator garden in an island grouping. It's surrounded by uh, non-combustible uh, materials such as the stucco of this um, retaining wall, um, the brick sidewalk and the driveway which act as fuel breaks for the home. Um, we, we really like to encourage uh, California native plants. They're um, adapted 
um, to our Mediterranean environment. They're the preferred choice for, for landscapes. They require very little water. They're low maintenance. Um, and they support our wildlife, which is a really nice benefit. And, and while these characteristics make native plants a good choice for fire smart gardens, their features do not directly translate to fire resistance. All plants will burn. So this garden has a lot of fire smart features that support the environment, including um, these spaces. Uh, between uh, this walkway, so you get uh, um, uh, water um, that can uh, continue to support um, the, uh, the health of the soil, um, and it, it penetrates back into the soil. Uh, you've got good spacing between these the trees um, and the bushes. Um, you can see that the lower branches are, are quite away uh, from the, the bushes underneath them. You've got really nice spacing. Um, here across the property, both horizontally as well as vertically. Um, the trees are very nicely pruned. Um, there's no uh, seeming dead branches. Um, and the, the use of these boulders around the property um, can help to break up the continuity of plantings um, and act as a fuel break. Um, this backyard uses uh, decomposed granite. Uh, for their pathways while still using wood mulch to protect um, the soil, um, keeping these plants seemingly very healthy and green, um, you know, providing and, and, and keeping the, the nutrients to the plants um, in the soil. Um, it looks like the plantings uh, near this stucco foundation are low, um, and even though it's within the, the five-foot uh, zone, um, they're well below these doors. Uh, they're far enough away, excuse me, these windows, they're far enough away from the door and uh, they seem to be very well hydrated. Um, this is another garden uh, that provides excellent horizontal and vertical spacing. You can see that um, the lowest branches of these uh, older trees is well above um, uh, the plantings in this garden, and you have some really nice spacing um, uh, horizontally as well. And I, I suspect this garden is, is uh, you know, well beyond 10 feet from the home. And so here we have the use of, of wood mulch, uh, which, which is quite appropriate. And this is a lovely, you know, for those of us who live in, a, in more of a, a urban, uh, you know, kind of sloped setting, this is a really lovely pollinator garden um, uh, in an urban setting, and it's, it's clearly well hydrated. It uses river rocks to hold the hillside in, in place to, to prevent erosion, and, and you can just see it's just beautifully maintained. So how plants are spaced um, in that 30-foot zone so, you know, we've talked about zero to five feet and then beyond five feet up to 30 feet. Um, it's, it's, it's also a very important part of the defensible space strategy. You want to um, minimize or eliminate combustible materials and vegetation in this range, um, which, which will reduce the potential for direct flame contact and elevated radiant heat exposure. So, you know, as embers land on the property, they can ignite material, that material can uh, produce a flame, that, pr that flame produces radiant heat. Radiant heat um, uh, dries plants out very quickly. So um, this illustration uh, points out how to reduce. So for example, reducing the connectivity. So you can have plants grouped together, but then you wanna create some space between them. And in, in this case, you, the, the lower limbs of the trees, you want to you keep them uh, pruned up um, to, to reduce um, fire ladders. And a fire ladder would be if this plant or this bush was any closer, if this were to catch on fire, those flames could get up into the canopy of the tree. And so this is what you're trying to reduce on your property in, in, in this zone that's farther away from the house. Um, same thing with uh, tree spacing. 
um, you, you just want to make sure that um, you your your trees aren't um, uh, so close together that the fire in the canopy could jump quickly from one to the next. So in this illustration, um, focus on the difference between the top and the bottom images. Um, this top illustration shows poor landscape maintenance where um, the tree branches are growing down into the shrubs. There are continuous masses of shrubs. Um, the, the tree branches overhang the roof. It's, it's hard to tell from this illustration, but the idea is that if it's within 10 feet of a chimney, that's dangerous. Um, and then here you can see that there are masses of shrubs against the house. In the lower illustration, um, there's adequate spacing now between groupings of uh, shrubs and trees, and that helps to prevent the fire from pardon me, climbing um, into the top portion of the tree or the shrub. Um, the foundation plants under the windows have been removed. Um, the tree has been significantly thinned and pruned up. It, it wasn't removed. It didn't need to be removed, but it's been, it's been properly maintained. Um, and it's good if you can prune limbs and branches uh, to a minimum height of six feet off the ground. Um, for shorter trees, pruning should never exceed a third of the tree height. Um, some of us, um, our homes are located on, on steeper slopes um, in a windy area or, or um, in an area surrounded by unusually dense, tall, or combustible vegetation. Um, in this case, your thinning requirements increase. Um, when your home is at the top of a slope, you want to keep in mind that fire and heat rise, and that allows for preheating of the upslope fuel. So as I mentioned earlier, you can imagine if, if this uh, bush or tree caught on fire and you have flames, those flames are now, the, the, the radiant heat off of those flames is now heating up all this vegetation in between, and, um, and that has an extraordinary drying effect. So, um, but you also really wanna be careful that when you remove dead trees and shrubs, leave the roots in place, because that will help prevent erosion. Um, if you re replace plants, um, plant new ones, but again, going back to our, our you know, properly spacing of plants, Make sure that at maturity, um, you have that distance that you need to prevent fire from either drying out the plant next to it or, or jumping uh, to it. Um, you can also use, depending on your property, you can also use things like walls. Um, this is a more expensive uh, option, but um, it, it can help to slow the spread of fire and it, it also helps prevent erosion and slope and stability. So, as we mentioned before, you know, water is a precious resource in, in our drought prone climate. So, in addition to adhering to the irrigation guidelines that um, we've already gone over, um, it's really important that um, you pay attention to uh, red flag warning days. Um, do not wet down your property on a red flag warning day. You should just irrigate as normal. Um, Overwatering on a red flag day depletes water tanks and the fire departments depend on those water tanks being full should a fire occur. Um, another thing to do is to clearly mark all emergency, any type of water source available on your property. Um, I, had, I had a little bit of eye candy because we're getting towards the end of the presentation. So I thought you'd all appreciate having something fun here, but even though the cat isn't the, the permanent marker, you really do want to find ways to um, identify where the water sources are on your property so that if a fire official uh, does need to come onto your property, they can find them quickly and easily. Uh, it's, it's a nice thing to store um, some extra hoses with some emergency supplies and, and keep those hoses available 
for firefighters. You can see on the tips of these hoses, these are called quick connects. Um, you can get these at the, at the hardware store. I have these on all of my hoses. And as a gardener, it's really nice to have these because depending on, on what you're watering, you may want to have different length hoses. And um, my hands are arthritic at this point in my life. And, uh, you know, twisting and turning uh, to, to get these um, onto the spigots can be pretty hard on the hand. Um, these quick, quick connects make that a lot easier. Oh, I also should mention that um, I, I don't know how many people on the call uh, rely on a well uh, for their water uh, source, but you sh if you do, um, consider purchasing an emergency generator to operate the pump um, should there be a power failure. Um, as the size of the property increases, so do the opportunities for strategic fire defense. So for those of you who live higher up on the ridge, um, it's a good practice to thin and prune trees, um, mow the grass and cut back shrubs along any road system. Um, and that allows for safety, for safe emergency access and evacuation from the property. Um, strategic fuel breaks can be an option, especially along the ridge lines or other critical control points that the fire the local fire departments can help I identify and, and work with you on that. On smaller residential properties, you can break up the continuity of fuel, um, uh, such as plantings using non-combustible materials. So for example, here's uh, an example of, of a patio. Um, uh, you can use uh, boulders. Um, this is a, a dry creek on a property. Um, or you could do something really fun and use broken pottery. Um, you can see examples of fuel breaks at um, the Serenity Garden. Um, this is a garden that the fire, that the um, Marine Master Gardeners, uh, we have a variety of demonstration gardens that, that uh, uh, we offer residents. Um, and uh, you can see these at the Falkirk Mansion um, in San Rafael. So, um, We, what, what, I've, what I've tried to go over today in the presentation is first and foremost, a healthy garden with healthy garden maintenance um, is you know, really about tending to the garden to keep it thriving. And when it comes to defensible space, the significance of, of proper plant and landscape maintenance cannot be overemphasized. Um, even the best designed landscape requires regular maintenance and poorly maintained landscapes can easily become a fire hazard regardless of which plants are grown. Um, generally speaking, fire smart maintenance is about eliminating fuel from your garden. So things like um, leaves in the gutter, re you know, removing dead or dried plant material and, you know, removing combustible materials uh, will help create almost immediately um, a fire smart landscape for you. So if, if you are ready with your phones, um, uh, pull up your, your camera because here's your list um, for fire smart property maintenance. And uh, fall is a great time to do your fire smart maintenance. Um, I strongly suggest that you take a walk around your property, um, study the first five feet. Once this is done, extend out beyond that. Uh, pull weeds, rake leaves, get rid of those needles, clear the gutters, um, clear off your rooftops, check for branches within 10 feet of your chimney, prune those back. Um, in general, try to keep branches pruned away from your roof, nothing under the deck. Um, if you have grass, uh, it's recommended that you avoid mowing it on hot or windy days. Um, move wood piles at least 30 feet away from um, any structure on your property and move combustible items like uh, the plastic uh, waste bins uh, um, uh, away from uh, your house or other structures on the property. So, how do you decide what type of environmentally sound and fire smart landscape works for you? Well, you gotta ask yourself some questions. You know, what's your lifestyle? What's your budget? What are your needs? What are your interests? What's your aesthetic? 
What about your neighbor and your neighborhood? How tolerant are you with risk? Um, what about your privacy? And as you start to think about these questions, these will help to inform your plant choices. So I'll bet you're feeling overwhelmed. Okay, well, where do you start? Start with simple maintenance. Clear your roof, your gutters, your property of dead vegetation. You can do that today. It, it really doesn't cost anything to do that. Prune back branches, anything that's dead on your property, you can prune any time of year. Certain plants require uh, different times of the year uh, to be pruned, uh, but is, if, if it's dead, you can, you can eliminate it any time of the year. Um, next, contact your, your city and your, your local fire agency and talk to them about defensible space ordinances. Um, find out if there's ingress or egress requirements. Um, you know, uh, here in Sausalito, our fire departments, um, uh, th their equipment is large and our, our, many of our streets are very narrow. And if there's vegetation, um, uh, you know, overarching the, the road, um, that can um, actually damage uh, equipment on, on their vehicles. And um, uh, if, if you're okay with the fire department cutting back um, vegetation on your property that, that uh, uh, causes ingress or egress uh, uh, problems for their vehicles, um, then, then they'll do that. Um, if, if, it's, if it's vegetation that you care about, then you might want to um, talk to your gardener about reducing the size of that and pulling that back so that it does not impede ingress or egress. Um, longer term, you know, winter is a great time to start your planning process for the next fire season. Um, it's a time when you can consider the cost of materials, the cost of labor. You can create a budget um, you, and then you can start to prioritize what you can and can't do from year to year. Um, you know, as you assess your property, really focus initially on that first five feet around the perimeter. And then depending on the size of your property, um, what you do with that first five feet is really going to depend on uh, curb appeal and, and, and your, your uh, tolerance for risk. Um, you know, in urban settings here in Sausalito, uh, many of our properties are, are quite small and, uh, you know, filling them with uh, uh, permeable material uh, pretty much, you know, within five feet pretty much takes us to the sidewalk. And so that's a case where, you know, it, on my property, I use um, native plants. Um, that are water wise. I, I only, I don't use any mulch. I, instead I, I use uh, compost. I, I, I refresh it um, uh, constantly um, to keep the soil healthy. And um, I, I use uh, a lot of boulders to create uh, fuel breaks and uh, a lot of succulent material. So in summary, um, healthy landscape, know your climate, keep your soil healthy, use water based on the needs of the plant, plant the right place in the right, right plant in the right place, and please do not plant invasives um, and think about uh, protecting and encouraging wildlife. Um, fire smart landscape, we cannot emphasize maintenance enough. Water according to the plant's needs, no more, no less. Again, right plant, right place. Um, Spacing is critical. Use non-combustible materials to create fuel breaks. And um, you can reference the FireSafe Marin website uh, for um, evacuation information, zone zero information, home hardening. They, they, they've got a great website. Um, and we work very closely uh, as partners with them. We have resources to help you. Um, our uh, uh, we have our, our, our website, uh, which has a six minute video on it, which is an overview of this presentation. Um, if you have questions about um, plants on your property, if you need help identifying what they are, or you don't understand why their leaves are turning brown, you can take photos, you can send them via email to our help desk, you can call. Uh, we have a free uh, newsletter that is emailed uh, monthly. Uh, you can take a picture of that QR code and that should help you get signed up for that. 
I mentioned the garden walks. We also have a YouTube channel where, where we have a variety of educational um, uh, um, videos ranging anywhere from six minutes to uh, 60 minutes. Um, and then uh, we publish uh, monthly through uh, social media uh, tips, uh, fire smart landscaping tips. So um, we also have the demonstration gardens, uh, the one I mentioned at Falkirk Cultural Center in San Rafael. Um, this gives you an idea of what plants look like in their mature state. And we also have uh, the one at Harvey's Garden uh, at Blackie's Pasture in, in Tiburon. So with that, I think I will uh, turn this over to uh, Cheryl uh, for any kind of questions that we might have. Thank you so much, Faye. Um, I, does everyone feel like they have to go and completely renovate the landscaping around their home now? I think I do. Um, that was really, really informative. And some of it I knew, some of it I didn't. Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions. I know I have some, um, but I know we've got some from our attendees as well. Sandra Bushmaker. Um, wants to know about the fire department recommendations to remove rosemary, bamboo, acacia, and one other plant, which she can't remember. So um, my response, can I stop screen sharing for just a minute so I can see the yes. audience? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, hi, Bill. Um, well, you know, so many of these answers are, it depends, right? Um, first and foremost, it depends on the size. It depends on how well is it maintained? How, how hydrated is it? How large is it? Where is it in relation to your home? Where is it in relation to the street? Um, you know, where is it in relation to your, to your ingress or egress um, access points um, in and out of your house? Is it close to a window? Um, if it ignited, could it could it cause a window to burst? If it ignited, could it could it feed flame in through uh, a vent system in the foundation of of your home? Um, I yeah, that's how I would answer that question. It it really depends. Okay, we also have a question from um, Lorna Newland, and you talked about spiders as a beneficial insect. Can you explain the reasons why, since she's especially allergic to spider bites? And <laughs> so it's just part of the ecosystem. Um, spiders are on our landscape. I mean, there's, um, if you're especially allergic, um, I might suggest wearing uh, leather gloves when you're gardening um, and stay, um, you know, uh, just stay well protected. Um, but there's really, un unless you're using pesticides, which we strongly request um, that you don't do that, um, there are gonna be spiders on your property. So really the only way that, that um, as I suggested, just you know, cover yourself up really well. Um, I, I mean, I've been gardening almost all my life. I never put my hand in the soil. Um, there's brown recluse. I mean, there there are actually dangerous spiders. So, um, you know, I just I'm I'm always covered up when when I garden. Okay, I have thank you, um, and I will just say many people are saying thank you for this presentation. It was informative, and we that's great. I agree. Um, one of my questions is: We live Sausalito is a study in zero property lot lines. I mean, we're just on top of one another. And so you do worry a little bit about what your neighbors are doing as well as what you're doing. So the first question in relationship to that is, most people have fences between their, you know, the, the, the one foot between their two houses. Is it better just to have the wooden fence or is it better to have vegetation on that fence? I'm guessing that the vegetation makes it more combustible and you don't want to, you don't want that. Although most people do that to, again, you know, create more of a visual aesthetic, more of a break between the properties. So the question is about the fence or about the plantings? 
Well, Bo, well, is it better to, I mean, obviously the fence is combustible if it's a wooden fence, right. but it doesn't make it worse if there are plants on it and trees in front of it to block the home. I'm guessing it would. It, it, it can. Uh, again, it depends on the maintenance. It, it depends on how well the plant is hydrated. It depends on how close the plant is. If, if the plant is actually growing directly on the fence, um, uh, often there's dead material behind the green that you may not see. Right. Um, the one recommendation from the fire department is that um, they don't, we, no one expects us to replace our fences. So um, the request is that the uh, door or whatever is leading to the home, whether it's a door or whether it's a, a, a wall part of the fence, that that be, um, that that part not be wood. And so, you know, metal, a metal gate is recommended um, without any, you, you wanna break up the continuity of, of the wood. So no wood posts uh, against the woods, uh, against the siding of the house. Um, and then use of a metal gate. And, uh, you know, as far as plantings are concerned, uh, maintenance is key you know, uh, try to create that spacing that I talked about, um, you know, prune away any kind of dead, dead matter, dead material. And if in fact there are neighbors um, that are not, you might be maintaining your property, but they are clearly not, and it appears to be hazardous under current, particularly current conditions. Um, do you go to the fire department? Do you go to the Sausalito, you know, Southern Marin Fire? Do you go to Sausalito Public Works Department, if, I mean, obviously you try to connect with the neighbors yourself, maybe get other neighbors to connect as well, to speak to those people, but what are, what's the best course of action? I think what you just said, you know, the first thing that you can do is just talk to the neighbor. Um, there really is no enforcement. I mean, the, the fire department could, you know, offer them advice, mm -hmm. um, but, um, Unfortunately, you know, we, we can't, we can't force people to, right. to do things with their property. It's their property. Right. But um, I think there can be, um, you know, there, there are firewise communities now and um, uh, people still listening to the call can go to the Fire uh, Safe Marin website and read more about firewise communities. And there's quite a bit of information there about how communities come together to support one another um, and, and, and to help one another, because sometimes people either don't have the money, don't have the physical ability um, to do some of the maintenance. And, and, you know, sometimes neighbors will come together and say, hey, let's have a cleanup Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of a, a really nice neighborly thing to, to do. And, 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 you know, it, it, it has great benefit, not only for the neighborhood, but in terms of, you know, creating uh, uh, a good energy in, in the neighborhood. Yeah, that's good. Well, I would like to talk a lot more about soil because I think almost all soil on Sausalito is not very good. And also, is it ridiculous to try to do anything in Hurricane Gulch, in the old town, the south end of town because of the wind? And I'd like to know what are the most wind resistant plants. So, but I'm gonna follow up with you offline on that because we're sort of running out of time. And I wanna, get to Bill Hines, who's been kind enough to join us. And I want to real quickly, um, I can go into a lot more detail if you want to come by the store with all these books, but we have accumulated mostly because I'm an avid gardener and I love flowers and trees and birds and bees. We have books on California native plants. We have books on pollinators. Um, we have, uh, I think, we have books on growing vegetables and herbs, what you can grow year round, um, the Northwest Garden Manifesto. Uh, again, I'm not gonna talk about these too much. Succulents, and as Faye mentioned, are excellent to incorporate into your native planting gardens. We have lots of succulent books. Um, everybody is into a sustainable, having a sustainable food source in their backyard these days, um, since we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we have a lot of books on um, vegetable gardening, including doing it in containers. You don't need to have a ton of space. You can do it on your deck. You can have an herb garden on your kitchen window. Um, so we have a lot of those books. But if you can only buy one book and you are serious about um, defensible landscaping, and this is the one, Faye turned me on to this, 
It's a New York Times bestseller. It's called Nature's Best Hope. And basically, if you're worried about the planet, change starts in your backyard. And this has just, it's, it's such a great read. It has so many great ideas. And it is, as they say, a new approach to conservation. And you can really start it right here in your own yard. So it's a very exciting book. But we have tons of books we'd be happy to share with you. I now want to move on to Bill, who's been so patient. Um, I think many of you may know about Sausalito Beautiful. Their mission is to enhance and protect Sausalito's public landscapes through advocacy, partnership, um, cultivating a community-wide culture of responsibility. And Bill is the president of that organization, which Faye actually helped found. And uh, he is also a principal with SWA, which is an international landscape architecture planning and urban design form. He is a landscape architect, so he knows a lot about this, um, particularly in Sausalito, because that's where this business is based, and they've done many, many projects. Um, so, Bill, can you give us your quick take on Fire Smart? landscaping in Sausalito and and talk a little bit too about what Sausalito Beautiful um, has done, many projects and initiatives. Absolutely. And uh, I would be remiss uh, without mentioning that uh, you are on our advisory board as well, uh, Cheryl. So we appreciate your participation and encouragement and, and advice uh, over the years. Thank you. Um, I think Faye did an amazing job of getting her arms around a very complex topic. Uh, and, you know, as she sort of implied with all of these things, there are trade-offs for, you know, every individual piece. Um, you know, thinking about big picture sustainability, probably shouldn't plant a lawn. Thinking about what happens in the zone zero or zone one, maybe, you know, lawn does make some sense in terms of creating those fire breaks. So I think the takeaway here is that, um, you know, there are a lot of really nuanced approaches um, and it's not something that you can get right just by looking at a pamphlet or a, a plant list necessarily. Um, you know, this is not my first fire safe lecture, if you can believe it. Um, but I've found the frequency of them, it seems to be picking up over the last few years. Um, and I have, you know, across um, my practice come in contact with arborists that have uh, authored these lists of pyrophytic plant materials. Uh, and I would say that those things should not be necessarily prohibited. Um, but I do think that, you know, there is a case to be made for keeping the plants around your building healthy, uh, keeping them irrigated. And a big part of that is selecting the right plant and providing the right soil and the right conditions so that, you know, that, um, you know, is, is sustainable and, um, you know, does, does provide that sort of fire break. So I think Faye did a, a great job at explaining how these different issues are related. Um, this is an issue where, you know, there really is no uh, silver bullet. Um, and it's a sort of a myriad of factors that, that um, you know, plays into it. Um, you know, certainly in terms of plant selection, uh, the work that we've been doing with Sausalito Beautiful uh, locally, you know, is, is certainly touches on a lot of these key uh, tenets of making sure that we have, you know, good soil in, in tree wells, um, making sure that, that uh, plants are getting irrigated and, and caring for, and, um, you know, really trying to think long term uh, about plant spacing and the way things fill in. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with our work, uh, some of our projects in, around town are Bull in our Plaza. Um, that's a project that's so full of succulents around that sculpture right now that succulents can actually be harvested from that project. So when the plant spacing starts to get tight, there may be another, you know, opportunity to propagate those plants. Um, you know, we've also, all, we were always, uh, or have been, uh, you know, very involved in the medians over the last few years and getting those uh, going. It's amazing to look at those agaves and, and sort of the size uh, they're getting in the medians now. They're just amazingly beautiful. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of planting of street trees on Caledonia and then replanting trees uh, downtown Bridgeway, including um, a project that I worked on at SWA, the Ice House Plaza, and also worked on the Praca de Cache Kai. Um, Sausalito Beautiful also, you know, made tree donations for those projects. Again, tried, trying to get a 
unified uh, corridor of trees downtown and, you know, really um, trying to uh, maintain a landscape that's, you know, on par with the caliber of our community, uh, which I think is pretty great. Um, so, you know, we, in addition to sort of the project stuff, we've, we've been focusing on advocacy with uh, the general plan, um, you know, thinking about ways of, of financing and, and, you know, kind of paying for landscapes and maintenance. Um, we are a, a very active organization of doers and uh, I just thought I'd mention if, if anybody else, um, you know, is, is interested in what we're doing, wants to hear more about it, has an interest in volunteering, um, or, or just getting to, to know us better, uh, definitely look us up. Our website saucelitabeautiful.org. Uh, you can email me, Bill, at saucelitabeautiful.org, uh, and, you know, we'll get you, uh, get you connected. Um, you know, we really have a need for all types of people across all different backgrounds. We have a couple board members that are relocating. And so, uh, you know, there may be some opportunities if you're good with, um, you know, bookkeeping or have some accounting background. We, you know, do uh, a quarterly mailing. So we have opportunities to kind of plug into marketing related things. We have opportunities to lead projects, maybe even in your own neighborhood. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest projects that we've done lately has been uh, MLK Park. Uh, MLK, we've we planted uh, over 90 trees in that park in the last year. That's probably more trees than have been planted in public spaces in Sausalito in the last decade, uh, especially if we don't count Dunphy Park and, you know, some of the bigger recent projects, which we're very excited to see happen. Um, so that's kind of an overview of who we are as an organization, what we've been busy with. Um, and, you know, the, uh, one of the great things is that's uh, how I met Faye and I met you. So it's uh, also uh, kind of encouraged some really nice friendships, uh, some interesting uh, sort of collegial debate and discussion, and, you know, has also uh, sort of unleashed all these other resources uh, in terms of understanding the landscape and the community that we live in. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to everyone involved with Suffered and Beautiful because it's an extraordinary volunteer organization here in town that has really made a huge difference. Um, thank you also to Faye for your brilliant presentation and all this expert advice. There are a few questions that we didn't get to, um, but I'm going to email them to Faye and she will get back to you directly. All of our attendees and participants will be getting a link to this video so you can look at it again. And Faye, thank you Faye and thank you uh, UC Marin Master Gardeners. They have a great handout that kind of summarizes everything in this presentation as well, which we're going to share with you. So you have no excuse now to have a very fire smart garden landscape plan at your home or business. But thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we are open seven days a week here at Sausalito Books by the Bay and we have to observe all of the pandemic protocols with social distancing and sanitizing your hands and masks, of course. But we welcome you to come browse with us, take a look at our garden books and um, hopefully we'll be able to do these events live again very soon. So thank you again, Faye and Bill. Thank you, Cheryl. And you this was good. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Be well and be safe. <laughs>